here this morning. Of course, happy Pentecost. It's Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is kind of the fulfillment of the Easter season, right? So today closes out the Easter season. This is what we've been moving towards. It's the birth of the church, uh, right? And so 40 days of Lent, but even more in Easter, 50 days of Easter. We've been working uh, towards this for the last few months. Uh, Pentecost is a very, very powerful feast, a feast of the church, uh, a feast of the birth of the church. So much to talk about today, uh, but don't worry, I'll limit myself to two points. Uh, your two points for today. First, I want to talk uh, kind of about the feast of Pentecost in general, and then I want to talk about the Eucharistic revival. When I was in seminary, uh, right, right, we have our different apostolates, we go out to different places. One of the years I was in seminary, one of my apostolates was to go to the hospital. And I'll be honest, it was actually the one I was most nervous for, to go to the hospital, to pray with people, to talk with people, to bring people communion. I was more terrified of going to the hospital than I was of going to the prison, uh, which is really interesting. Part of the reason why I was nervous is because when I got there, I didn't speak the language. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to respond. And right, especially if you work in the hospital or if you're familiar, they use all these acronyms and, and things and right, all these um, kind of sicknesses and illnesses that I just didn't know a lot about. So I remember going to the hospital and going up to people's rooms and, and kind of you know, making my rounds, going door to door and saying, you know, hi, I'm Sean. I'm the chaplain, uh, can I pray with you? And they would begin to speak and they would begin to, um, you know, kind of tell about their experience of being in the hospital, their loneliness maybe, or their sickness and, and how they feel distant. And the beauty of being able to speak with them, the beauty of being able to pray with them. But I remember one day in prayer, like being really frustrated with the Lord. Lord, why did you assign me here? I don't know what to do. I don't have a nursing background. I don't know about these things. I was complaining in front of the Lord more and more and more. Lord, what if this happens? Then what am I supposed to do? What if this happens? How am I supposed to respond? And as I was just kind of complaining in front of the Lord, very clearly, he just stopped me and he said, Sean, it caught my attention. And I just sat there in silence. Yes, Lord. What is it that you want to say to me? And very clearly in that moment, I heard the Lord speak and say, I will be with you. I will be with you. You have nothing to be afraid of. I will give you the words. I will send my Holy Spirit, my advocate, my guide, my helper, so that you will be able to know what to say. Don't be afraid. I will be with you. I was reading the scriptures at the time, especially working through uh, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, right, we have uh, the patriarchs and the prophets. And what happens over and over again with these stories? Take Moses, for example. Moses, uh, he comes and he, he sees God in the burning bush. And God says to him, I want you to go and set my people free. And what does Moses say? I can't do that. I have a speech impediment. And we begin to complain. He begins to say, Lord, you, surely you're, 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 you, you need someone else to do this. I can't do this. And God says to him, I will be with you. I will be with you. To the prophets, to Jeremiah, to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, do not be afraid. I will be with you. And then many years later, the apostles in the upper room, I will be with you, Jesus says, to the end of the age. The Great Commission, as we heard last Sunday at the Ascension. I'm sending you out. Go. This is the purpose of the Ascension. This is the purpose of Pentecost. That we don't just stay in this church, but that we go out and spread the good news. Lord, I'm scared. I don't want to go. I don't know what to say. I don't know how I'm going to respond. I will be with you, even to the end of the age. And not just that, I will send you a helper, an advocate, someone in my name who will guide you, the counselor, the paraclete, the person of truth who will teach you what to say. That gave me great comfort of then being able to go into the hospital and being able to pray with people, to talk with people. 
I knew God was with me. I had nothing to be afraid of. One of the hard parts about being in the hospital for me, uh, but it was probably the most beautiful part. This hospital, this Catholic hospital I was at, they trained the chaplains to respond to all the codes. So whenever a code blue would come over the intercon system, the chaplains would go and respond to that code. Of course, not to do the, the CPR, we leave that for the nurses, but how many people, how many families are there when a code happens? And the nurses gently dismiss them outside the room uh, and the horror on those faces. My, my loved one, my, my father, my brother, my sibling, my son has just died. What do I do? And the chaplains would go and be with the family, maybe sit in the hallway or sit in the lobby and be able to pray with them and talk with them in the most kind of vulnerable moments of what they just saw and witnessed. But what's so cool uh, maybe about this time is oftentimes, as you know from a code, CPR, the person comes back to life. Not always, but oftentimes. This idea of resuscitation, to resuscitate someone, to revive someone, to revitalize someone. I think this is the work of the Holy Spirit. How much more then are these family members who are grieving, who are in shock, how much more do they need to be, in a sense, resuscitated in the Holy Spirit? Lord, my faith is dead, bring it back to life. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, where are the Jews? Where are the apostles? Acts chapter two, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. We often think of Pentecost in the upper room. They're not in the upper room. They're actually in the temple. They're in the temple because that's what they had known. They go there and pray. The apostles are there over and over again before Jesus, during Jesus, and after Jesus. That's what they had known. And then the Holy Spirit reveals himself like a rush of mighty wind and filled the whole house, the whole temple area where they were. Not just on the apostles, but on all those who were with them. And then people began to hear the gospel message, maybe for the first time in their own native language, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Jude Judea, Cappadocia. If you actually look at that on a map, Jerusalem is at the center and everything else is surrounding it. The Holy Spirit wants to, to blow where he wills. He wants to bring the good news to everyone, speaking in tongues so that they could understand. Peter then addresses the crowd and afterwards it says 3,000 people that day were baptized. The conversions of the power of the Holy Spirit. But what about our gospel for today? This isn't Pentecost, but it's still a giving of the Holy Spirit. On the evening of that day, this is Easter Sunday night. For fear of the Jews, uh, the apostles are hiding in that upper room. They don't know what to do. Certainly Jesus has resurrected. They have great hope, but they don't know how to respond now. Jesus comes in their midst. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, Today, the Father and the Son want to breathe on you and give you the Holy Spirit. The first time in the Bible where God breathes on someone. Genesis 2. God creates Adam out of the clay, takes his nostrils, and it says he breathes the breath of life into their nostrils. What was dead has now come to life. This is a revival revivescence, to give someone life. And certainly the apostles experience that as well. They who feel dead, Jesus, you have gone. Certainly you, we have hope in the resurrection. We, we don't see your body in the tomb, but what are we supposed to do? We feel lost. And they're revived in the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe one connection with the Mass. 
the priest, when he says the words of consecration, he has to speak them out loud. Certainly before microphones, this was even true. Microphones, uh, technology has greatly changed the way that we celebrate Mass. But the priest must say the words of consecration audibly. Why? Because when he takes that piece of bread, he leans over and he says, take this, all of you, right next to his lips, because he's breathing, as Christ, breathing the breath of life into that piece of bread. And then the chalice, the same thing. What is wine? He breathes on it, and then it becomes the blood of Christ. The bishop at the, um, at the chrism mass, the sacred chrism, that holy oil that's used for baptism and confirmation and holy orders. The bishop mixes the sacred chrism and the balsam together. If you've ever been to a chrism mass, you see the bishop do this. He leans over on that jar and he blows. He puts his breath on it that the Holy Spirit may come in that oil, the same oil that we receive on our confirmations, that our hearts may become renewed, revived, and alive. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. Today, God is breathing upon you. Those places of your hearts that are dead, God wants to give you new life. The second point for today is the Eucharistic revival. Revival. It's not a Eucharistic renewal. It's a revival. Why? Because the revival is the work of the Holy Spirit. We're currently in the midst of this. The United States Bishop Conference, uh, they, right, they've launched uh, this Eucharistic revival that started last year. This was a prep year for now, beginning on Corpus Christi in just a couple weeks, the parish year where we're going to do different things in the parish promoting this Eucharistic revival. That God would revive us, not just in our belief in the Eucharist, but also in uh, our encounter of the Eucharist, that we may know the power that the Eucharist has to transform us, to make us new, to give us new life. Culminating at the end of this parish year, will be a big national Eucharistic conference, a congress, in Indianapolis, where there'll be 80,000 people in Lucas Oil Stadium. Certainly, you're welcome to go. Tickets are selling fast, so uh, you better get on that. 80,000 Catholics worshiping the Eucharist, worshiping the Blessed Sacrament in the kind of revivescence, the revival, the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you saw in the news a few months ago back in February, that that university in Kentucky, Asbury University, had this, what they call the Asbury Revival. Where at their chapel, right, Protestant University, at their chapel, um, afterwards, uh, this great kind of um, homily, sermon, there were some students who didn't want to leave. They said, we want the Holy Spirit more. We want him to come and bestow his power upon us. And they were so hungry that they stayed and stayed and prayed and prayed. And all night they went before uh, the Lord in, in praise and worship and song. And they said, come Holy Spirit. And more and more students kept coming. For two weeks this went on, that 24-7 there were uh, different people who came in to give sermons. There were uh, praise and worship and different leaders of, of, of praise groups coming uh, around the clock 24-7. People were traveling from around the nation to come there, begging the Holy Spirit for healing for his gifts, for maybe a baptism in the Holy Spirit. A few weeks ago, this went on in a Catholic church, a Catholic uh, campus center out in New York. The Holy Spirit is very much alive today, brothers and sisters, and today he wants to breathe upon you, to give you new life. Last weekend, we had that great uh, encounter conference, the encounter of the Holy Spirit, and we had a healing service here where many people experienced the profound healing of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to revitalize you. He wants to revive you. And I think this is what the Eucharistic revival is all about. That we might have uh, a new zeal as the birth of the church, a new zeal to go and proclaim the good news to the ends of the world. Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do this. I will be with you. I will send the counselor, the advocate, the helper, 
to teach you how to speak, to give you the truth. Brothers and sisters, where is your faith? Where is your heart? Are there places that are dead within you? Today, the Holy Spirit breathes on you to revitalize you, to give you a revificence, to make you new. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come to bring us new life. Those places in our hearts that are dead, we ask you to breathe new life into them so that we may go baptizing all the nations, teaching them, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.